Okay, so I think we will get started with uh, introductions. Everyone should be able to see all the panelists at this point. So we'll get started with very brief introductions. Um, we're still waiting on Saad. I think he had some trouble getting in maybe. Yeah, I don't think that Saad is here, but we will take care of that. Um, just as a quick intro, so I'm John Opperman. I am executive director of Earth Day Initiative. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we have various sustainability and climate action campaigns throughout the year. We also organize large scale Earth Day events every spring. You can check us out at earthdayinitiative.org, Instagram, Earth Day Initiative, all spelled out. If anyone has trouble hearing us or seeing us during the course of this, just hit that in the chat. Give us a heads up. We have some Harvard Forward folks that should also be monitoring us for any technical glitches along the way. Again, you can find the chat if you're not familiar with it already, probably down at the bottom of your panel, depending on how your uh, setup is oriented. But you should be able to hit chat and enter any questions in there as we go. We'll also circulate resources at the end of this. So we'll send out various details on voting, other resources that you can reach um, out to different institutions in your own life. Uh, we actually have Saad right here, so we're going to add him, and we should be good to go. So now, yeah, let's get started. We're going to do very brief introductions, so let's just run through um, each one of the moderators and the panelists. So first off, joining me as a co-moderator is Lauren Blackford. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Sure. Hi, everyone. Welcome. So excited you're here. Uh, until recently, I was the president of the Sierra Club board, Sierra Club Large, environmental and increasingly social justice organization, primarily in the United States. I've turned off that board. I'm now on the Sierra Club Foundation board, uh, chairing their investment committee. So uh, in addition to having divested, we're really looking at other tools like shareholder engagement, impact investing, selecting carefully funds uh, to really fuel the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy and really focusing on doing that in a way that uh, centers equity, justice, and inclusion. So really excited about this conversation and these candidates. Exactly. And it's very relevant to the topic at hand. So super happy to have you join us for the town hall today, Lauren. Saad, can you hear us? Yep. Do you want to yeah. introduce yourself quickly? Yes, absolutely. Hi, everybody. My name is Saad Amer. I am the founder of Plus One Vote, which is an organization that is dedicated to getting out the vote. We focus on issues like climate change, social justice, healthcare, and, you know, just trying to make sure we have a better, more representative democracy, especially now that we're here in 2020. So thank you guys all for joining us. Awesome. And then just quick intros for each one of the Harvard Forward candidates. Jason, do you want to kick things off just with uh, basically quick intro to what you do, what you focus on? Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Jason Toy. I, uh, I went to Harvard School of Health class of 2019. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I work for the Environmental Protection Agency, where I do program evaluation. Uh, one of the five Harvard Forward uh, candidates, and I'm excited to be here today. Great. Thank you very much. And Thea, do you want to? Thank you. Hi, guys. My name is Thea Sebastian. I'm also one of the five Harvard Forward candidates. I graduated from Harvard College in 2008. I graduated from Harvard Law School in 2016. And I am currently a civil rights lawyer. So I lead policy work for a nonprofit organization in Washington, DC, which does impact litigation and policy work to end systemic injustice in the criminal legal system, of which there is a lot, spoiler alert. Great, thank you, Thea. And Midge? Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry, I do that every time, no matter how many meetings I have. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Margaret Purse, also known as Midge. Um, I'm a professional soccer player for Sky Blue FC and the U.S. Women's National Team. Um, I am on the Indira Cells Collective Bargaining Executive Committee, and I am also a part of the newly forming Indira Cell Black Coalition Players Coalition. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Midge. And Lisa? 
Hi everyone, I'm Lisa B. Huang. I graduated from Harvard Kennedy School in 2019. Um, I have a strong passion for promoting uh, technology-enabled services for better access on education, service, financing, etc. So I've been um, a consultant at Bain & Company, an impact investor at Bill and Miller Gates Foundation, um, an investor for Tencent M&A, and also a CFO for OZE, a fintech company that helps, uh, that brings access to accounting, financing services to entrepreneurs in West Africa. And at this moment, I'm on maternity leave with my first son. So excuse me for sometimes crying in the background. So at, at this moment, I'm staying in Hong Kong with family. Can't wait for the world to get back to normal again. No worries. I think during these times, there's a lot of crying in the background, at least crying in our hearts. Uh, <laughs> Sure. Uh, my name is John Beatty. I'm a uh, graduated 2011 from the college, currently living in Seattle, working at Amazon. But before that, I was an impact investor for five years, uh, focusing on sustainability, both in environmental sustainability and social sustainability, focus on community development and economic empowerment. Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. Um, so we have a good number of people on the line right now. And there are various people from the Harvard community. There are a lot of people who are not necessarily part of the Harvard community. We really wanna draw lessons from this campaign specifically about divesting Harvard and more inclusive governance and responsible investing for the Harvard context and draw lessons for the broader world, the various institutions and in all of our lives. To kick things off for anyone who's on um, the webinar right now, who's maybe not totally familiar with how the campaign came about, the history of it, sort of what's behind it. Midge, can you tell us a bit about how the campaign came about, what the inspiration was, and who was behind the campaign to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so I went to school with Nathan Goldberg. We went to school together. Um, class, he's a class below me. I was 2017, and um, he's one of the founders of Harvard Forward, him and Danielle Strasberg. Um, and during our time at Harvard, we had a lot of conversations about the need for more diverse vo voices in governance, um, more diverse uh, voices representing the younger generations and people who had a under greater understanding of the experience of what it's like to go to Harvard today um, and the issues that are presented to current students and recent alumni. Um, and we had these conversations before Harvard Forward was even a thought. Um, but upon learning more and more about the board, which I mean, I can say that most of my class and the class even then don't know about the board right now. Um, and they're unaware of its responsibilities, its agenda. But as we learn more about it, we recognize that that would be a good place to make our good faith actionable. Um, and slowly, the idea of Harvard Ford, I think, more with Nathan and Danielle started to manifest itself, and it grew into what I'm really shocked to see and, and impressed to see a, a really big movement in its own for Harvard. Thanks so much. And uh, so our next question is going to you, Jason. Um, and it's about, I mean, there's so much going on this year. And so I wanted to ask you about how all these different challenges that we're facing right now are interrelated. Uh, the things that have come to the forefront this year around public health, the COVID crisis, racial justice, Black Lives Matter, and of course, climate change. Um, and then also, not only how are they all interrelated, but how specifically can Harvard Forward Platform respond to all these challenges in a systematic and impactful way? Jay, so it looks like you're still on mute. Oh, you're on mute. Am I, am I on mute still? You're good now. Okay. No, no, yeah, no, Lauren, that's a great question to um, ask. So, like, what's been difficult this year is that a lot of these challenges that are coming, that, like you said, came up, are interrelated. So, we're looking at a lot of the things related to public health crises. As you've seen regarding COVID-19, that a lot of black, black, and brown communities have faced some of the highest bur disease burden and some of the highest death rates in the United States. And to couple of things, when we're talking about racial justice, um, these same communities also are dealing with environmental racism, with siting, 
up hazardous waste facilities, um, adverse fossil fuel generation control facilities, uh, and also not even having adequate resources and interest. And moving forward with climate change and climate justice, as these impacts continue to grow as this material um, these both North and South of the equator are being impacted, and a lot of times those still are under black and black. So with the Black Lives Matter movement, as a looking for racial justice, it really goes hand in hand with uh, public health and environmental justice because these communities are feeling diverted from that um, from systemic racism, um, which can lead to low education attainment, um, lower opportunity for low nutritional value, and just horrible air quality and resource needs. What Harvard Ford can do to help this is basically help acknowledge that this is a problem, that systemic racism from the environmental health and climate front um, are related, and we can put in efforts that can make uh, to make changes. So specifically, uh, actually doing climate action, you know, putting being a strong leader to develop its uh, stances and policies and education, so that we can then get more universities and more information to take effort. We can talk about these issues uh, that comes from systemic. So we can talk about the environmental issues about years and start sharing a lens more into this and not just using it that these communities are just, that's just what they should be and more so that they're being first. Uh, and like I said, luckily our platform of climate justice, um, you know, inclusive government gets more work than um, having a more diverse uh, board, diverse electorate, uh, and also being just uh, looking for racial quality to really push to make, uh, make changes. Thank you for that answer, Jason. Um, and thank you for really speaking about, about climate justice. I think the reality is that there is no climate justice without social justice. And so with that, Thea, I would love if you could tell us a little bit about how Harvard Forward is planning to integrate anti-racism uh, into, into centering a lot of the work for the campaign for the next several years. Yes, I would love to answer that question. You know, and just to really lift up what you said a moment ago and what Jason just said, climate justice is really at its core a racial justice issue. And for me, that was really the attraction to joining Harvard Forward, right? Given that my background is in civil rights, I kind of saw that link. And I think, unfortunately, we have seen that play out only even more with COVID-19, right? And looking at its disparate impacts. So in terms of how Harvard Forward can explicitly address racial justice moving forward. So for 2021, Harvard Forward has revamped the section of its platform to explicitly be working on this issue. And the Harvard Forward platform is going to be focusing on three things. Number one, divesting from the prison industrial complex. Number two, creating an ethnic studies department in concentration. And number three, supporting anti-racism initiatives on campus. So those are gonna be the three top lines. And Harvard Forward has not yet released the specifics of what that platform will include for policies. But I can give you a sense of some of the things that I personally think would probably wind up in the mix or that at the very least should be considered. So number one, thinking about the name Harvard Overseers, it is pretty crazy that in the year 2020, we are actually running for a position that is called overseers. So I think step number one is ideally before we even get to take a seat, right, we could actually change the name of this institution. And that also should engender a broader conversation about rethinking a lot of the structures at Harvard and just being intentional and mindful about who feels welcome and who doesn't feel welcome on campus as a result of the way that things are set up. And whether that's the name of institutions or whether that is what goes onto different shields for different institutions across campus, those are conversations we need to have. We also need to do a better job of listening to students, and in particular, first generation students, students of color, immigrant students, students who are going to be particularly impacted by decisions that Harvard is making. And we saw examples of where this would have been really helpful with the decision to evacuate students from campus so quickly, 
right, in a way that wasn't mindful of people's individual circumstances. Uh, some of the decisions being made about room and board over this next year as Harvard goes virtual, right? These are decisions that are having a disparate impact on students based on all sorts of factors, and we believe that students really need to be at the table as a result of that. Um, so we could go on. There's, you know, questions around hiring. There's questions around how we support students. Um, but I really think at its core, supporting anti-racism initiatives on campus has to start by listening to students, by talking to students, and really by elevating their voices in all of the conversations that the Harvard administration is having. Thank you, Thea. And I think that's something that we'll actually come back to. It looks like we have at least one question kind of related to that topic that we'll circle back to toward the end. And then uh, turning to John, this is a question that we're sending your way in terms of, can you speak to the argument that divesting doesn't actually have a significant impact on an industry, that Harvard's investments are a drop in the bucket of the overall financial system and the fossil fuel industry even? And then what are some of the ways that people can get involved in their own communities if they do feel like that is impactful? So universities, banks, municipalities, whatever it might be. Um, first, the question is, how is it actually impactful when the system is so large? And then second, how do we take these lessons from what we're doing here with Harvard forward into other contexts of our lives and the institutions that touch our lives? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a real classic around divestment. Um, and I think something that folks have talked about. I'll have one comment about Harvard, which is that applies maybe least of all to Harvard given a $40 billion endowment. I mean, that's, you know, the S&P was like three to 5%. We don't know how much of Harvard's endowment is invested in fossil fuels. About three to 5% of the S&P is invested in oil and gas. So assuming a, a similar amount, we're talking a couple billion dollars coming out of Harvard and going into the fossil fuel industry, which is, I mean, that's a significant portion of the Dakota Access Pipeline or oil rigs. That's, you know, even just on a purely financial basis is significant. But I think all that being said, the impact as we think about it is larger. And it's larger because it's about a conversation about how people are framing their investments and sort of what is what is acceptable and what people are interested in supporting. Uh, Desmond Tutu actually, he, he wrote a op-ed for the FT where he pointed out that around apartheid, I mean, it's a quote, he said, in the 70s, the divestment movement was critical in apartheid and shifting the international conversation around the acceptability of this regime. We need to do the same thing for climate. And I think that's very powerful and you can see it with people who don't even particularly care about the climate crisis. Um, actually, a, a Harvard, another Harvard alum, Jim Cramer, little known fact, Harvard Law School of mad money and sort of CNBC stock picking, had a quote in February where he said, look, I think you can make money pumping oil. I wouldn't do it because no one would invest in me. And he's like, the new folks, they don't want to do this, and so therefore I will not invest in it. And so when you have a financial system where you're sort of trying to play the game of who else is going to get in on it, having large players like Harvard, I mean, Georgetown's already done it, UVM announced today, Oxford's done it, Brown's done it, the UC system's done it. When you have these large institutions saying, you know what, no, we're not, we believe this is a problem, we're not going to pour money into it, that has a ripple effect in terms of the capital supply and sort of who else is willing to do it. So I do think there's a very powerful uh, long-run impact divestment and making that clear. Um, that being said, we don't all have $40 billion to invest. Uh, for those of us who are lucky enough to have some retirement funds or otherwise assets to invest, the good news is there's an increasing amount of ETFs. You know, when I started impact investing in 2011, we had to set up private accounts to get fossil fuels excluded and sort of do good things. Now, you know, Vanguard, Fidelity, sort of major brokerages are offering that to folks. And I think that's a very natural place to say, let's just, let's cut it out um, and not support it. But I think there's also a huge impact in reaching out to your organizations because anyone who's investing has to be, if you're putting it in the market, that means you are partially supporting these institutions. And that means, you know, it could be a hospital, it could be a school, it could be 
high school, like a private high school that has an endowment if they're so lucky. Um, it could be nonprofits that have some cash on hand. Are you keeping that with a credit union or are you keeping that with a bank that might be supporting drilling in the Anwar or mountaintop removal or coal plants? Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think uh, 350.org has a great sort of explainer on personal divestment, but I would really encourage people to think about the communities they're part of, because I think one thing we've learned from Harvard Forward is like, you know, people step forward in a really exciting way. And people that maybe hadn't been as engaged in the Harvard community were like, you know, I haven't responded to a Harvard email in 10 years, but I saw this and I thought it was important and it mattered. And so there are these communities that it's really exciting to sort of mobilize and even on a small level of the pension funds of your local town, whatever it is, um, to take a stance on this and join the movement. I think another good resource is the Stop the Money Pipeline group. So if you just Google Stop the Money Pipeline, they have a lot of resources on various banks, their involvement in fossil fuels, the different ways that you can divest in your own life. So that's another resource that folks can check out. Great. Thank you, John and John. Um, Margaret, the next question is for you. And, um, and I see this also came up in the chat. Uh, somebody was asking about, is it fair to say that a majority of the nominating signers were more motivated by their positions on climate change rather than those on governance? So the next question is actually about governance. Um, so Margaret, can you speak a bit to the various measures being proposed that are aimed at more inclusive governance and amplifying student voices? including reserved seats on the board for recent alumni, town halls, and the State of the Union sessions. And specifically, what can we do to accomplish the goal of more inclusive governance? Yeah, um, I don't, to answer the question, the original question, the initial question, I don't think you can say that um, there's this more of an emphasis. I think that all the candidates are extremely passionate about inclusive governance. And I think it's intersectional with the climate crisis because, you know, part of the reason that the climate crisis is so important to us is because it is so important to the students and the recent alumni right now. So there is a, a, a big part of intersectionality with this issue um, and how it's and tied to inclusive governments in general. Um, I'm, I'm personally really excited about the inclusive governance initiatives that we are proposing. Um, we're proposing to have six of the 30 elected seats of the board be reserved for recent alumni. Um, and recent alumni would be defined as individuals who graduated in the last four years. Um, this structure is the same structure that goes on at Princeton, MIT, Cornell, Duke. They already have this in place where they reserve seats for recent alumni. And we think it's a really amazing thing. We think that, again, that those voices need to be heard, that they provide a unique perspective that is not available and honestly doesn't seem like it's really sought out at the moment. Um, so that that's really exciting and, and this would be a good turnover for the for the rest of the elections. And you, you can read about it on our platform. We propose that the elections for these individuals would hold at the same time as the normal board um, and just the nitty gritty of how this would actually work. Um, in terms of town halls, we, something, as you can see now, like we think town halls are, are very important. We think it's important that people understand what the board is doing, the agenda, the um, issues that they are speaking to and they're trying to resolve. And we think it's important that they hear about student experiences, recent alumni experiences and how that fits into their decisions. So we propose that there should be three town halls a year um, and that at least five board members be present at those town halls to communicate with the students and recent alumni so that they can hear, you know, from the horse's mouth what's going on and um, the thought process, process going into decisions. Um, and finally, I think this one's probably my favorite of the inclusive governance initiatives. I'm really excited about this, but we propose that the graduate council and the undergraduate council presidents and vice presidents present to the current board on issues that they're having. And you know, I don't think it can really get more inclusive than that when you really, you quite literally have the heads of the governing, of the, um, the students, the undergraduates and the graduates coming in and speaking on behalf of themselves and telling you exactly what their experiences are firsthand um, and how we can help with that. So, you know, it's, it's really exciting. And I, and I think you can, you can see it in our platform that this is something we're really passionate about. And I don't really think that, um, 
an addendum of more knowledge is ever a bad thing. Also, just to chime in quickly with my two cents on that. So that was partially speaking to a question that we got about if it's fair to say that a majority of the nominating signers for the Harvard Forward candidates were motivated more by positions on climate change rather than on governance. I do think that there's been a huge emphasis in the climate movement in general, going back a decade or more, to really focus on inclusion, partially to make up for what was a criticism of the earlier environmental movement. That there was a belief that the earlier environmental movement perhaps very quickly became an upper middle class white movement and represented the concerns of upper, upper middle class white people. And I think that the climate movement has gone um, to great lengths to be more inclusive. So I think that that is really pursued, tied in with climate action at, in its own right. At the same time, more inclusive governance leads to these outcomes because I think that there's a belief that if we are more inclusive, we would actually have policies that move us toward climate action because it truly is something that the average person is concerned about. And if we open things up to perhaps younger generations, people whose voices have traditionally been shut out of this conversation, that we would actually get those policies because they're all wrapped up together and more inclusive voting in general, whether it's for Harvard or for national government, local government, whatever it is, we would wind up with policies that move us in that direction. My two cents on that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think the reality is that when it comes to inclusion and when it comes to turnout, it's really important that people actually show up. You know, we have so much of an emphasis on our national elections, and I'm someone who runs a voting nonprofit, right? So we tend to think of the presidency, maybe we're looking at a couple Senate seats or some Congress people. But the reality is so many changes happen at the local level, in your state legislatures, in even more hyper local or places like school boards or here at the Harvard Board of Overseers. It's a, it's a really great example of how your vote can have a really profound impact, especially given the reality that only about 12% of el eligible voters are actually going to be voting historically. So you can totally transform what happens by voting with Harvard because, you know, we have, we have one of the largest endowments in the world. So for Lisa, my question to you is, what lessons can we take away from this effort to elect the Harvard Forward candidates to the Board of Overseers? Thanks. Um, so I think the first one is definitely uh, the voices unheard wants to be heard. So when we came together initially as a group of friends to start Harvard Forward, it wasn't just the, the big ideas that moved us. It was more about getting more voices heard. Um, we came from communities that have said again and again, like, geez, wouldn't it be great if Harvard can do this or move towards that? Yet for the election of the Board of Overseers, the highest democrat uh, democratically got, uh, elected governing body for Harvard, very few joined the 12% that typically vote. So um, we started with the big ideas and wanting to represent the unheard voices. And yet every day we move forward, we hear more from the 88%. Um, during my time in Harvard, uh, I was the executive vice president of the Kennedy School Student Government. We strive for more direct communication with the board rather than being represented in a very vague way. And I also remember students yarn for uh, further inclusion. They actually need to organize sit-ins and protest during my graduation ceremony and Harvard Yale game of that year to make their voices heard on climate change, on diverse movement. I think it reflects the lack of systematic way of representation and communication uh, that leads to this kind of inefficient way of participation. But through this Harvard Forward journey, um, we think that these who uh, uh, wouldn't other, otherwise participated um, came together to make their voices heard. That's why the journey is so rewarding. Every time we move forward, when we organize events or town hall like this, we see more and more alums come forward and join and then email us, message us, um, talk about what uh, their hopes about uh, Harvard governing, and this is extremely rewarding. So I think what matters more, at least to me, than the board seat itself is the opportunity to stick to and bring out the 88%. I think the other lesson is changes are very hard. I remember in, uh, at the very beginning of the Harvard Four movement, we struggled to get the petition in signing form, uh, the system going because uh, very few time was the petition uh, process triggered before. 
Um, so all those struggles we went through, um, it was the support from the alums, including all the attendees joining the webinar today, um, that it makes us still feel hopeful and excited about the cause. Um, we are not to upheave the system, but I think we're trying to uh, make it complete. But this change is hard, getting the representation of the more recent graduate alums that, and those who think Harvard should do a better job at being a leader in sustainability, inclusion, and racial justice. So um, also I wanna take this time to thank the attendees of the town hall today. You are part of the change now. Great, and I think we can turn to some of the questions that we've gotten throughout this. Um, one of the questions is a common one in terms of the conversation around divestment, and I'm not sure who of the Harvard Forward candidates would wanna tackle this, but the idea that divestment versus actually engaging as a major investment player with particular industries, and in this case, it would be fossil fuels. So is it better to engage as an investor and push change from within, you could say, or divest? And why have the Harvard Forward candidates and a lot of others actually pushed for divestment over engagement as an investor? Yeah, John. I'll my hand for this one. Um, yeah, because I think there are, two, there are two components to point out. One is, um, one issue with engagement generally with fossil fuels is sort of, you know, like criticality. Like we are not, it is different to engage with a company where fossil fuel production or utiliz utilization is not essential to their business model. Like you can sort of induce someone to quit smoking. You can't really induce them to quit breathing air. And like BP or like ExxonMobil, their core business function you know, they may describe it as energy, but 99% of their business comes from the extraction and sale of fossil fuels. And so it just creates a really hard problem where it's like, if you work with, let's say Microsoft, like Microsoft doesn't really want to emit things and they will do stuff to avoid that. And therefore you can sort of engage with them to take actions on that in a way that with BP or Chevron or other folks, you're really cutting against the grain in such an aggressive way. And so that's one, one component. And the other one just comes down to a like, I mean, Harvard has taken an engagement approach and this is their response. Um, you know, I had a chance, I I'm a, work at Amazon. I'm a member of the Amazon Employees for Climate Justice, where we've been doing our own uh, shareholder resolution. Work. And that has brought me in contact with a group called Majority Action, um, which, does sort of similar work to Harvard Forward, Yale Forward, but for corporate boards um, and focused on removing directors with pro-fossil fuel activity and sort of selecting others. And they had a big win in April when they kicked the former CEO of ExxonMobil off the JP Morgan board. That was the first time anyone had sort of been removed from a major board of directors in America for having fossil fuel dies. And the lesson, which is so important, and I think somewhere where engagement runs wrong, is like engagement without consequences is not engagement. Like it's not a real dialogue. And the idea that you can talk to these people, but like they can do what they want and you'll still invest in them, doesn't, there's no, there's no stick to that carrot. And I think something that majority action has done really well is said, no, if you do this, these people will not serve on your board. And we are going to sort of take steps, we will walk out of this discussion. Um, and that's where I think divestment has a lot of sort of rhetorical powers to say, look, we, we are engaging with you, but until you stop doing this, we're not going to do it. It's a drastic step, but I think given the existential crisis that is climate change, uh, appropriate. So I think that's sort of how we've generally thought about divestment around the issue of like, A, you're trying to engage with a company to give up its primary profit and B, what role does Harvard play as a longer term investor where they can sort of walk away from the table until such a time as they come back versus shorter term investors who are generally always gonna stay in King's I have just a few quick points to add on that. Yeah. So one is that 
A complicating factor is that much of what Harvard has invested in is through these commingled assets that does make constructive engagement very difficult. So that's just kind of a practicality point. But then I think there's also a much broader point, which really goes back to the kind of narrative impact that John was talking about in his opening question, right? That part of what we're really trying to do here is change the public conversation around what is acceptable to be investing in, what are the kind of dramatic changes that our world really needs to make when faced with this emergency. And the fact is, it sends an incredibly different message to say, we are getting out of the fossil fuel business, right? We are getting away from that entirely, just the way that we wanted to get away from apartheid in South Africa. Then to say, oh, we're gonna to continue to have conversations, but we really hope to move them in the right direction at an incremental pace. Like, that's just not sending the same message. That is not how movements are built. That is not how wide scale, rapid, dramatic social change happens. And I think that this moment for our world is a time where we need that kind of dramatic change. I'm just gonna piggyback that because you know we're we're just gonna do it. <laughs> and I, their answers were were so amazing, and they attacked it from from all the angles. And I just want to like give the like final like synopsis of it is it's very simply we're taking away the social license. You know, we're trying to show that like we're questioning the norm and fundamentally saying you know how legitimate is this really now? Like we're stepping away from it, just as Thea said, um, because of its major impact on the climate crisis and. Um, I, I think that you can really look at it as like, what are you really trying to do as Thea says? You know, we're not, we're not trying to kind of support it, perpetuate it, like alter it. We're trying to dismantle it in a way. So, um, yeah. So following on that question, another one that comes up is sort of, so what does leadership look like beyond divesting? Um, so curious about your thoughts. Uh, there are some questions in the chat about you know, what do you invest in? Uh, communities, communities of color, low-income communities, also thinking about future pandemics, education, other topics. Um, but what for, for Harvard specifically, uh, what does climate leadership and other leadership look like beyond investing? Sure, I'm happy to lead off. I'll throw out one thing and then we can just piggyback and everyone else should add. So one thing just to uplift from our Harvard Forward campaign platform is that we really want to see Harvard take the mantle of climate leadership when it comes to the very thing that Harvard does best. And what Harvard really does best is research and education. Harvard has some of the greatest faculty members in the world who are really leading the charge on so many of these issues, on developing new technologies, on using legal tools to make sure that we can implement the right policies, on figuring out what the right policies are, right? You know, on thinking about the public health impacts, as I'm sure Jason can speak much more about. And so what we really want to see is Harvard investing more money to grow the number of faculty who are focused on these kinds of activities and then also ensuring that every single student across Harvard can be taking classes that really does relate to the climate crisis in some way. And so creating the like uh, just expanding the amount of resources that are going into the education function of Harvard. And we just want to mention that we are not trying to recreate the wheel here. There have been faculty members who have been really leading the charge and trying to have Harvard create this kind of broad scale inter-school initiative. And we really do stand behind those efforts and we want to work with them hopefully to see that vision become a reality. Yeah, and I would, I mean, the phrase is divest, reinvest. And I think that's speaking to a little bit about what does going beyond divestment look. Something we've made sure to include in our platform is um, space for sort of a framework around socially responsible investing. Uh, because I think one of the issues we have is just the lack of transparency and a lack of responsiveness around this, where it's just the university sort of takes the alumni money and then does what it wants with it um, without any sort of sense of where that's being put to work used, uh, except for the largest donors. And so when we think about the social responsible investing, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and we propose working with both the corporation and the overseers to set up a process to decide around that. But the good news is that there's been 
you know, just from a purely, purely practical, there's been a huge boom in the providing of these services. You know, the HMC, the Harvard Management Company, that manages the $40 billion endowment has dozens of people engage um, in managing its investments. And it would not be, I think, asking too much of them to start setting up an impact practice uh, that ideally, similar to how Yale set the tone for endowment management and active endowment management, I think there's an opportunity for Harvard to set the tone for active endowment impact and how we're measuring that and how we're sort of putting our assets to work around that. Um, that could be community investment through CDFIs, community notes. It could be health-related issues. I mean, education does seem like a natural area for Harvard to support, um, given its expertise. But I think there are a lot of opportunities there and a lot of sort of tools and folks who are waiting in the wings to help make that enough. Another thing that yes. came up in the questions, or actually, Jason, uh, you, you can, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I agree with the points then that were being said on that, um, and regarding looking at it from all from all areas, so from looking at doing public health research um, to looking at um, the specific climate impact and the environmental changes, um, to also looking at what are the economic uh, factors to actually transition, what are the mechanisms. Um, and I know uh, and it was touched on, and I don't know if you're uh, moving forward to this now, but one of the things that I saw in the comments was regarding uh, the agriculture and food, uh, food industry and the impacts of that. And uh, just throwing another lens is um, making the campus uh, more sustainable in its dining and it's, and it's also in its travel. Um, so looking at how they can basically, you know, have more things that are locally sourced. Um, and a lower lower carbon intensive, so that's uh, people that um, spread meat from far places. Um, but also looking at things like faculty travel, um, you know, one thing about this pandemic has shown is that uh, we're able to do a lot of work uh, remotely and from different places. And looking at all the scopes of our missions, one, scope two, scope three, it's very important to really um, address our individual carbon footprint and also to lead and make recommendations on that. To other universities that work with, they can. Thanks. And, and John, just going to note that um, if you also, if you look at the platform, the section on campus sustainability efforts, there's some additional information there uh, from Divest Faculty White Paper. Um, so take a look about at serving meals with lower associated greenhouse gas emissions and responsibly sourced ingredients in the dining hall. Yeah, thank you for that too. So another theme of questions that has come through the chat as well, kind of focuses on, so why this slate of candidates? Like why the Harvard Forward Five instead of some of the other nominees also, it was brought up in terms of age, someone who I think he said um, he's in his 60s, he really believes in being able to turn things over to the next generation. But I think he pointed out that this feels like skipping a generation where it's actually moving from his generation to another one, even two steps lower. So why is that important? Why is it important to have representation from people who have graduated so recently from Harvard affiliated schools and sort of why you guys? Yeah, I think Lisa, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I think I can start to take a first crap and then um, everyone on the team can add to it. I think um, from two ways. One, uh, the recent grads understand what the students are thinking the best, and then the students are actually heavily impacted by a lot of the decisions that Harvard Governing determined. And I think having that representation on the table will help students, which is the which is who will become Harvard alums in one day to have a better experience, feel more included um, on campus. And also, we're not saying that, oh, the everyone on the table should be in their 30s for the board of overseers. We're saying that the voices need to be heard from the younger generation. If we need to be the diversity on the table, then we are, we are not afraid of to be the, the most different one. I think, um, at this time, we're trying to overcracking a little bit, but then by sending out this message, we do hope that in the years to follow, um, 
anyone in from any age, as long as they're alarmed, they should feel uh, it's possible for them to get on the slate. It's possible for them to make their voices heard, to join the effort uh, to be on the board of overseers. Um, and then I think um, just as Michael uh, was asking the question, like what's the best reason to jumping down the age and experience scale to you? I actually, um, I understand that that will be a concern and question for a lot of the, um, especially the um, uh, the alarms in say in the 60s and the 70s. But I do under, uh, but I do think because uh, it's sometimes hard to understand um, like different per person's perspective and where are we coming from. I think that's why it is important for us to be actually sitting on a table and bring the voices of our generation on a variety of issues, including the sustainability, as well as like racial justice, um, LGBTQ, all kinds of issues that may not seem as important as um, urgent and burning for the current board of overseers, but for um, our generation. Yeah, that was, that was well said. I, I think it was Michael and Peter who had, ask that question. I'm really excited to answer this. Um, the board has 30, 30 people on it. And um, your generations are already represented, uh, which is necessary. And it's it's a wonderful thing. And what we're doing is we're not we're not flipping the board, you're not flipping the board by electing six, six younger um, candidates, what you're doing is is you're enhancing its ability to relate to all generations to all of Harvard, it's now representing all of its recent alumni, all of its alumni, not just its recent alumni, not just its older alumni, all of its students. And we provide that unique perspective that you really, it, it's, it's essential if, if you want any, if you want to improve governance, it's, you just need to have it. And, um, you know, I think everyone, absolutely, you are completely right in saying everyone is impressive, accomplished. Um, and that should be the standard. I don't think that's a differentiating factor. I think that's the standard. And um, I think we are really providing the, this gap, this hole that's not fulfilled right now on, on the board for inclusive governments. You know, we're committed to listening. We're committed to understanding everyone's perspectives. I think, you know, it's not even in good faith, it's actionable and you can, you can see it, we're here right now and you're asking us questions. Um, I don't know of other candidates who have presented the same opportunity. Um, and I think that in itself kind of shows you a, a difference in how, how we're moving forward and how we're being more effective and how we really will progress the governance and the way that the board operates. Hey. Yeah, I have one thing uh, that I would also offer up to this question, which is that it's absolutely true that people's experience and qualifications are really important. Agree that that should be the standard. But I think it also matters what people are going to fight for when they're actually on the board. I think what has made Harvard Forward such a unique thing in the history of Harvard, really, um, perhaps with the exception of some of the candidacies around anti-apartheid, is that we're standing for something. We're here because we have a set of policy positions that unites us, because we want Harvard to die best because we want to become a climate leader, because we want to have inclusive governance. And so in other words, you know what you're gonna get. You know exactly what we're gonna fight for. You know how we're going to measure our own success for our tenure on the boards. And I think that's actually something that's unique and different. That's not the approach that people usually take with the board of overseers. And so to be honest, I actually see that as being the biggest change that we offer. It's not about our ages, it's not about our positions, it's about the fact that we're actually running on something, we're running on a real platform. And I think that's really exciting. I love yeah, that. I, uh, uh, I was gonna say, I, I echo that. I mean, a lot of us, we've been involved in recent years um, working on all these issues while we were at Harvard, so working on um, divestment related issues, working on climate related issues, um, ready, working in the governance between students, um, like with student government and working administration. And similar to what Thea said about, we will fight, we're running a platform actually fighting on this, is we've seen how 
not having these opportunities can fail the current student. Um, and we got really engaged in them and learned you know, from our times they have learned. So as we're coming on to the board, we really can help leverage both that perspective as a student and an alum and really know uh, what they actually need. And I'll just speak my own experience. Uh, one reason I got engaged at Harcourt was during my time there, I was part of the one Harvard Climate Initiative that surveyed the students across the Harvard campus. And two thirds of students said that climate education was black and that we wanted more. And I said that myself, and it was something that I've been super interested in, in increasing the education, the work, um, and the leadership of it. So I think as we come home, that we have a stand, and we will fight and work for these issues. I love that you guys are bringing a lot of new energy and a lot of new passion to this movement. So, you know, across the climate movement as a whole, we've been seeing a lot of that. A question that we got is, you know, how would you suggest that new activists join this movement? You know, if you guys could have everyone walk away from this and, you know, in addition to filling out their ballots, I have mine right here, look at that. In addition to filling out their ballots, what action would you want everybody who's on this call right now watching take to support what you guys are doing? Are, okay, I guess. Oh, yeah, who wants to go first? <laughs> um, I can start quickly. I guess um, in uh, in a matter of time. Um, so I think step one is to vote, and then to tell everyone about it. Um, tell your friends. Tell my uh, friends who graduate Hover, who didn't graduate from Hover, um, about this platform, and then get people moving. Um, and also, I think in the long run. Uh, I think live in a more sustainable way um, to try to live in a low carbon footprint way. We know the changes not happen, like the Rome is not built in one day, but I think we believe in every small steps we take. Great, I'll, I'll just throw in two more things. So first thing is specifically for Harvard Forward, go to our website. You'll see there's a tab that says join us and you should get information about how you can volunteer, how you can help spread the word, how you can do vote tripling, which um, I'm sure there are other folks on the, this panel whose, whose jobs are more centered on getting around the vote can talk about how important that is. So that's one thing. But then the other thing is that a lot of you guys are alums of other schools that are not Harvard. So here's something you can do. Go start a Brown forward, start a Stanford forward, start a University of Massachusetts forward, start this initiative at whatever other school you're engaged with because that's the ultimate vision, right? It's not just about Harvard. Harvard is where we're starting, but there's already a Yale forward campaign underway. And we're hoping that so many other schools will follow because this is just an untapped opportunity to really think about these elections for boards as a way of moving this incredibly important issue forward. Yeah, and don't and stop at schools, <laughs> churches, all your groups. Yeah, I would really, i double down on that just because I think one of the most important things we've seen is like giving, having a feeling like you are part of a community where you can do something is incredibly empowering. And I think that's something that we found to really engage folks and really like build a sense of what we're doing, which is, Harvard alumni are like, oh, only Harvard alumni can have a say in this. When you work on your alma mater in your church and your community, you feel like you're actually part of that particular community and you are uniquely suited to taking action in that environment in a way that it may be harder. When you talk about like taking action at the federal level, there are lots of people doing it. The question is who is doing it in your community um, and around the various communities of interest you have, be it at work, be it your community of faith, be it your school. Uh, I'd also be remiss not to plug uh, Thursday. If you go to the website, you will see we are having a phone banking with Bill McKibben, uh, six to eight Eastern Standard Time. Come out, it's virtual, it's fun. It's not nearly as scary as phone banking random Harvard alumni would sound like, but uh, I'd encourage everyone who can come out to come out. And last and lastly, I would say um, something you can do on your own time um, is read. 
read and become well read on the subject, understand the pros and cons of the argument so that when you go to speak about this with people, you can really explain and, you know, maybe turn some other people's perspectives and their opinions on things and open their eyes and enlighten them to this fight. Um, because I think, you know, you have to really understand what you're talking about. It's, it's not a blind fight. And there's a reason why we have all come together to join in this fight. We, we understand the issue. We understand the urgency of the issue. Um, and we, you all need to as well to join the fight. So I think that's a big part of it as well. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's important to basically to take, take a stand and work with many of the groups you're involved in from previous academic institutions, nonprofits, community groups, friends, family, and just talk to these issues all them, and keep bringing up more. Uh, you know, we need as much help as we can get, and like and like uh, we all said, it, you know, it's not just hard for it. It's, we're trying to make a systematic change across the globe, and that's really important. Um, one thing, you know, I see there's a lot of questions in the chat box on uh, about sustainable agriculture. Um, so we'll definitely be able to follow up. Uh, we can follow up on that. Uh, that's something important to me. Uh, uh, been a vegetarian for four years, and a lot of help and environmental benefits from sustainable ag. So. Uh, we'll make sure that we'll answer this question. Yeah, and I think we're just about out of time. I know that there were a few questions about food that we mentioned here, so we will follow up. Um, like you said, Jason, someone from the Harvard Forward team will send around information about that. I think the only thing that I'll add on that last topic of what you can do is at Earth Day Initiative, we're actually launching a podcast, the first season of which focuses on being a climate communicator. Just talk about this stuff because there's a consensus forming around the fact that there's kind of a spiral of silence about climate action and talking about climate change. And sometimes people don't talk about the things that they really care about. And I think climate change really is vulnerable to that on a lot of fronts. People are overwhelmed or intimidated by the science, so they don't even want to go there. They don't want to be too earnest about a subject. Listen, if 2020 has showed us anything, I think that people should speak up. We've seen people actually raise their voices about things that matter in the last year or so, whether it's climate action, Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be, but just talking about it, whether it's choosing some product and you're opting to go with the product that's more sustainable, communicate that to the company. Communicate that I didn't choose your product because it's not sustainable, but I chose this other product. Whatever it is, but just talk about it is a big lesson that I've been learning in terms of being a quote, climate communicator. So I think we're out of time. Thank you so much to the moderators, Lauren and Todd. Thank you so much to all of the Harvard Forward candidates. We will be sending around information if you have more questions or comments about any of this. The real thing here is vote. So send along messages, forward information about this to any Harvard alums that you have. Get in touch with us for lessons that you can learn from the Harvard Forward campaign and take those into other aspects of your life. Any closing final comments from anybody? Um, thank you again for joining us tonight. Nope, we're all good. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good thank night. You. Here you vote. <laughs> good luck Ooh. to the candidates. Thank Ooh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.